Euh, J'invite sans plus tarder euh, M. Daniel Wouto. Il est professeur principal de psychologie philosophique et directeur de l'École des arts libéraux de l'Université de Wollo en Australie. Et je vous rappelle qu'il a été co-auteur co avec euh, Eric May de deux livres, Radicalizing an Activism and Evolving an Activism. Les titres de la conférence sont Going Radically Inactive, Why and What Follows. Alors, j'invite M. Uto à partager le écran. Merci. Voilà, le floor is yours. Thank you so much um, to everyone uh, for uh, being here today and, um, and to the organizers for organizing such a prominent and excellent conference. Um, I would say that um, as I'm going to, the, the nature of my presentation, I'll try to go slower than I usually do to aid the interpreters, but I'm sure I'll get nudged if I, if I speed up too much. But there's two constraints, as we just heard about temporality, finishing on time and at the same time going slow enough so you could follow me if you're listening in another language. Um, and I'll try to give the, the core of the structure of the talk very simply. Um, as you can see here, I'm trying to mesmerize you uh, into going radical, but I'll also, uh, apart from all those kinds of tricks, explain a bit what going radical really means in this sense. Um, I'll try to motivate a bit why we should take going radically seriously. And in the end, if I have a little bit of time, I'll be able to say something, I hope, about um, what applications or implications follow from doing so. So I think the first thing I want to highlight is, um, and the first slide had a meaning, you'll notice there that I had an image of roots, the original notion of radical that we had in mind when we pushed it is going to the roots of things as all philosophers seek to do. I also want to emphasize that um, our contributions to these discussions are primarily philosophical. So um, we aren't, or at least I don't think of myself as a, a cognitive scientist, but somebody who works on issues in the foundations of cognitive science. And, um, and that becomes rather important for understanding the nature of uh, the work that I think Eric and I have been doing. And the radicality is, uh, is a feature of the philosophical and approach and methods that we use. So it might help in that sense to think that some of uh, the people who criticized uh, our work have expected something quite different. Um, here, for example, in 2018, Evan Thompson uh, wrote a review and he rightly points out, um, speaking that they here is myself and Eric in our book, Evolving in Activism, they say they do not systematically construct a positive account from the ground up. They defend their claim that basic cognition is contentless by analyzing and criticizing other theories. And uh, the, the idea here is in some sense that the, the true work of cognitive science would be to produce one's own theory. Although I would have to say, I think that there's an awful lot of borrowing from our previous greats in this respect, in any case. Um, uh, uh, we heard yesterday a lot uh, going back to Varela and uh, presumably modifying in and constructing off the back of other people's visions, not always constructing from the ground up or from scratch oneself. Um, we in the book talk about a process, a philosophical process of rectification and Eric exemplified it a moment ago. It's quote, a process through which target accounts of cognition are radicalized by analysis and argument, rendering them compatible with a radically an active account of cognition. Um, and herein, um, we'll see some more examples of this it, as we go through the talk. Herein, the idea is not necessarily, again, to create something anew, but to analyze existing positions and to see in what ways they might be combined or more fruitfully um, at what elements we wish to leave out. So in a very important sense then, radical inactivism is not a type or brand of an activism. It's an effort to, um, uh, or an approach that aims to clarify and refine an activist ideas that already exist by radicalizing them 
or radicalizing in activism, as is the title, the emphasis on the verb there is important. And other neighboring positions as well, related proposals for conceiving of cognition to see what happens after they've been um, put through a philosophical mill to see whether or not um, we should retain elements of those positions or abandon them. You can think of what we do here as very much a philosophical activity and one of sculpting and refining and combining. And here, um, yes, it's true that a lot of that work is letting go because the more refined product is letting go of the elements that we don't want to get to something more beautiful and attractive. So if you think of this philosophical work as a bit of sculpting, it may help you to see how both letting go of material is at the same time perfecting and refining and beautifying a position rather than simply adding or defending a particular line. So if we look um, back at the opening session, uh, Sebastian did a great job of, of laying out the grounds, but I just wanted to, to put our position in a slightly different uh, perspective. Um, he raised the question about an embarrassment of riches. And certainly that's something we're trying to uh, address by not having many, many, many different varieties of an activism, but actually clarifying which elements of different positions are the positions we want to retain. And in doing so, the position has a radical stance. So he identified us or gave us a, a, a title of analytic inactivism, which would also make sense. There is an analytic dimension to the process, but as you'll see in its history, um, when we apply it to something like sensory motor inactivism, there are elements of that position that we let go of and what was retained is some of the core ideas that we wanted to hold on to. And a similar thing happened with the work, the more classical work that would have gone further back even to Varela, Thompson, Roche, De Paolo, and others. Again, we see what elements are compatible and how they might be put together in a more refined understanding that gets us the best account or the best conception uh, that we think is available of, for thinking about the mind. Well, one of the tools that we use in particular in our recent argumentation uh, has been to uh, articulate the hard problem of consciousness, a uh, hard problem of content, sorry, um, which in one of my favorite reviews of the book uh, is described as such as importing the obvious miasma of consciousness research into the very heart of cognitive science. And there, of course, was something about coining this term um, that, that captures this. We were trying to highlight that the difficulties um, that had been identified as especially hard uh, in the domain of consciousness studies were just as hard when we looked at the core and foundational assumptions that were being used in cognitive science. There are other differences, but that was the idea. And this author uh, puts it nicely. He says, Hado and Mian wield the hard problem of content the way the hero wields a wooden stake in a vampire movie. They patiently map out the implicatures of various content dependent approaches, show how each of them cope with various challenges, then they finally hammer the hard problem of content through their conceptual heart. And there is some truth that there is a, a little bit of violence in the account in the sense that we are trying to um, eliminate positions that we think are unviable or problematic or rest on problematic assumptions. Um, and here, um, this is not, is not just an influence for us in terms of an existing set of material. Uh, the um, uh, in item or line E, other, Wittgenstein, etc. What we've really done is reached out, at least certainly in my own background, I've drawn a lot on Wittgenstein in my thinking about how to approach these issues when we try to look at the ideas that are put forth by inactivists. And as Wittgenstein put it himself in Philosophical Investigations 118, where, doesn't, where does our investigation get its importance from? It seems only to destroy everything interesting that is all that is great and important, as it were all the buildings leaving behind only bits of stone and rubble. What we are destroying is nothing but houses of cards and we are clearing up the ground of language on which they stand. And as you can see here, um, for a long while, um, my approach to philosophy has been intertwined uh, or taken some inspiration from Wittgenstein. I don't claim to be um, following him to the letter, but applying some of the main ideas of how to get free from certain compelling pictures, and Eric was exemplifying it, is we try to clear up these philosophical 
uh, pictures or attractions or identify lines of reasoning that may be problematic and that may keep us from having a clear, clearer understanding of the phenomena itself and or how best to understand or explain it. Now, one question that might be raised, and again, to depend how we set this up is, well, do we still need to carry on radicalizing and activism and other e-theories? Um, because I do extend this to other e-theories because often I think our understanding or conception of the mind is not a finished product. We haven't yet settled on which of these is best. Um, and here again, I think it's of some interest that often as this is described, this uh, I pulled from the internet, um, we simply get a picture that we've moved away from cognitivist beginnings. Here you have it depicted, and it was depicted a bit historically yesterday as well, uh, moving out from the 1970s, uh, which are, I think are still in the past, last time I checked, and towards today, uh, 2021, that it would seem that we've moved to the idea of the inactive position on this model and away from cognitive computational positions, but that really can't be quite right. If anyone knows the uh, state of the field, uh, it's just that um, uh, inactive and uh, other positions have gained some credibility that they lacked um, back in the day, but they certainly haven't fully um, replaced or overseen uh, or got rid of um, the cognitivist and computational approaches, which are still very much alive and kicking. So what we're doing constantly is assessing the logical possibilities. We're not witnessing or taking part of, I think, in just a simple historical progression of theory. So that's one very important point. Um, and to wit, within the E framework, there is a wide spectrum of positions more radical than some more radical than others. Here's a simple where you sit on the conservative radical spectrum test. I won't have time to go through all these items, but uh, I can simply say that uh, dependent on which way you answer this, and you can answer it in various ways, um, you'll get a different kind of positioning in the state space. For example, um, do you commit to representationalism at all in any place or across the board? Do you commit to the computational view of the mind despite also embracing some form of e-theory or an activism? Do you believe that the mind still um, um, involves or must involve information processing? Are you a functionalist of a traditional sort? Um, are you committed to the idea that there is knowledge mediated cognition and so on and so on? And I think one finds with different theorists even now and many of whom would embrace an activism in some sense or in some part within their theory will um, give different answers to these questions. So, we're not in a situation where we have simply resolved these issues once and for all. Um, in fact, it's a really quite diverse E family. We go back to the embodied mind and work by Thompson that is inspired and followed from it. Other uh, commitments come from other beginnings such as um, um, Alva Noe's Action and Perception and his work with Susan Hurley and other work by Tony Chimero, which ties into the more pragmatist roots of, of thinking about the mind. And then there's, of course, from within the analytic tradition, much more the, well, actually this work by Andy Clark being there connect up with a lot of phenomenology, uh, but also uh, his work later on supersizing the mind and the extended mind. And there are even books upon all of these different positions and then how we might think about possibly combining them one of the concerns is a lot of the theorists, not all, but many of the theorists working in here, think about those possible combinations with an effort to find the E that rules them all. And it's not always obvious that that E would be an activism. Uh, that E for some might um, take some themes or ideas from an activism, but relegate them to a more marginal position in their overall theory. So jokingly, I found this on the web, you know, why does extended, why does extended the largest cognition not simply eat all of the other three of the classic four. Um, and that, of course, position is not a joke in the hands of some theorists. Okay, so that gives you a sense in which the, the very live questions of why we might still need to radicalize are uh, very much to the fore if you're engaged in lively debate in these areas. Um, I'm going to give you just two examples, and then I'll finish up with my uh, little reflections about applications. 
Let's look at the case of predictive processing and active inference. They've embraced many of the core ideas of an activism, but they do so typically under a lens that would be, I think, anathema to many of the central ideas even coming out of Varela, which was to provide an antidote to these more representationalist cognitivist um, thoughts. So um, sometimes it bounces back in the literature, but famously, um, Carl Friston has been promoting the idea that the brain is a statistical model of the world that it inhabits. And there's different ways that we might read his claim here. Um, for some, the key assumption is that, quote, the problem of causal inference for the brain uh, is analogous in many respects to our everyday reasoning about cause and effect and to the scientific methods of causal inference. In other words, they've taken seriously the analogy that the brain is, uh, is engaged in some scientific hypothesizing. Now, how seriously should we take the brain scientist analogy? In which respects, if any, should we take it seriously? Um, well, all from the authors here say, well, we are assuming that there is inferencing going on, but we're not assuming that it's explicit inference, nor do we assume that it's conscious inference. However, they do typically standardly assume that the brain is making contentful inferences at various levels. Um, uh, Jacob Howey, for example, assumes that the brain makes inferences to the best explanation that aim at truth. And when pressed on this in, uh, well, rhetorically in one of his own papers, Andy Clark deliberately raises the question in relation to an activism. Why not simply ditch the talk of inner models and internal representations and stay on the true path of an activist virtue, he asks himself. And he answers himself, or raises a further question rather, um, could we have told our story in entirely non-representational terms without invoking the concept of hierar a hierarchical, probabilistic, generative model at all? As things stand, he says, I simply do not see how this can be achieved. These I simply do not see how comments, which often pop up in philosophical work, are indications of their, of their conceptual character. And this is exactly why the work of philosophy is so important here. And I think Eric was really good with his uh, discussion of the thought experiment in the previous lecture. Uh, it illustrates that. Clark, and this is a paper that's just come out, it co-authored with Friston from 2021, is still trying to put an end to the representationalist war through a conciliatory and collaborativist approach um, in which he is still remaining committed to the idea of representations. Uh, as the authors of this paper put it, the paper claims to supply, quote, a mathematically informed reading of generative models that could accommodate both richly representationalist and dynamicist views of cognition. Um, the idea there is that these aren't states that simply describe, they also have an action-oriented aspect, but they also describe and they also represent. And this is not something that is acceptable if you think there are problems with the notion of representation. So this, is, um, this kind of work, I think, continues to be necessary for just these kinds of reasons. Importantly for us, um, the proposed answer by those authors doesn't address the hard problem of content and so leaves us none the wiser about how the brain could be in a position to make inferences to the best explanation. To explain how that could work, we would have to have a workable explanation of the brain's ab initio capacity to make contentful inferences, in addition to positing that its neural states carry covariant information. Uh, if people want to ask me for more detail about this, um, I can take them up in questions, but I've written about this extensively re recently as well. Um, and you'll see the assumptions at play if you look very carefully at the work by, of Clark in the literature. The point I want to make here, just more um, rather than getting into the full detail, uh, is that without a solution to the hard problem of content, other than simply repeating a familiar representational story, we have Pache Clark, no account or explanation of how brains are able to make inferences to the best explanation. That's an assumption, but it's not one that um, it's, it's, it, he's taking out a theoretical loan in order to make it. 
The result is, for Eric and I, um, is that we should be aware of taking seriously the idea that the most basic forms of cognition possess features which apparently only emerged with the late developing logical scientific practices that we have that are embedded in other normative practices that um, involve content. So anyone taking the brain scientist analogy very seriously will need to justify the assumption that such a mindset captures the essence of all cognition. That's something that we've challenged and continue to challenge uh, even in the current literature. Let me take another case, um, the case of sensory motor knowledge and activism, as it's called uh, uh, elegantly now. Um, sensory motor and activism, as it used to be called, the shortened version, um, goes back away to work by O'Regan and Noe back in 2001. They told us, quote, the central idea of our new approach is that vision is a mode of exploration of the world that is mediated by knowledge of what we call sensory motor contingencies. Now, advancing on that in 2004, Alva Noe told us, quote, world presenting perceptual content equates to representational content. And I'll give you the quote. Noe held then that, quote, for perceptual sensation to constitute experience, that is for it to have genuine representational content, the perceiver must possess and make use of sensory motor knowledge. That's how we come to see things um, as we think they are. Noe, uh, 2004, holds in the same mode that all perception is intrinsically thoughtful, all of it. And he is persuaded that in order to see, quote, one must have visual impressions that one understands. Hence the knowledge aspect, the under, underpinning knowledge. Now, interestingly, um, it's that work by Noe and Noe and O'Regan that inspired back in 2005, the very first uh, um, outing for radical inactivism. And the radical was precisely a comment on the fact that uh, Noe, despite himself, seemed to be conserving ideas from the cognitivist tradition that were at odds with other inactivists such as Varela uh, and such like, because that's actually the origins of the, of the, uh, of the, of the term radical inactivism and its actual scholar, scholarly history. Um, but in subsequent publications out of our heads and then again in varieties of presence, there seems to have been a, a shift in Noe's pos position on these things, uh, at least if you go by some standard quote, quotes that you might find in his work. So for example, um, he uh, putting himself against the idea that uh, we're brains of scientists, he says, the world does not show up for us quote, as it does because we project or interpret or confabulate or hypothesize in something like the way a scientist might posit the existence of an uh, unobserved force. So here he's setting his position very much against the Hemholtzian Sorry, sorry for interrupt. It's, it, it's, it, please, uh, slower. <laughs> yes, Slower okay. if possible uh, for okay, the thank you. thank you, sorry. No problem. Um, so, so here again, he's setting his um, position clearly against the Hemholtzian position um, advanced by uh, Friston on some interpretations, Clark and others that we discussed in the previous section. Or again, uh, he says, you are not your brain and your friend is not a construct inside you. She is not a representation in your mind, and her thoughts and feelings are not hidden inside her head. Your consciousness of her and the larger world around you is not an intellectual feat. Now, going by these quotations alone, we might raise the question, has Noe gone radical? Um, has he given up on those previous commitments that would look as uh, make him look as if he was committed to something that radical and activists would object to? The simple answer is no. Um, in a most recent paper in June 2021, and where he makes comments on his version of an activism and that advanced by myself and Eric, he has this to say, um, despite rejecting representationalism, in some respects, and this is important, 
contra rec no a 2021 quote tells us it is hard to see and so here again we have the language of uh that signals a, a philosophical moment there's some conceptual difficulty it's hard to see how in the absence of language experiences as rec or radical inactivism construes them could be worldly in the right kind of way what's what's the right kind of way well after all he says the only intentional directedness of cognition that radical inactivists are willing to allow in the absence of language is so minimal as to be compatible with the idea that perceptual experience itself makes no claims or demands on how things are and it's this i'll highlight the idea here that in some sense you can't have a worldly experience without making a claim about how the world is but that actually is the very core of um, a representationalist position I, I put it that if you look closely then, Noe 2021 remains as committed as ever to the idea that world presenting experience makes claims on how things are necessarily, otherwise it wouldn't be world presenting. It entails thereby um, representational correctness conditions, which is the key assumption of, uh, of a representational theory of mind. And also, he holds that our capacity to enjoy such experiences rests on an implicit practical knowledge and understanding. So the position in its core respects hasn't really changed um, since, since 2004, despite other claims that are made along the way. And this is, I think, the reason that Noe 2021 thinks that, quote, the real task is to rethink what representation, content, and other notions are or could be not to abandon these notions in the way that we have suggested. So again, it would take longer, too long perhaps here to take you through the nitty gritty of these rather refined discussions, but they turn out to be rather important. I mean, think of this for a moment. There's a variant of an activism, um, a popular one, that if on the official word of it is going to commit to some kind of representationalism, that's not going to sit well with other non-representationalist versions. And there is important work to be done to figure out how to understand that or determine which of these positions we might well adopt. I'll just finish with a comment about the, the old conundrum it doesn't go away for no way then. Our old objection was, what is sensory motor practical knowledge? How should we make sense of this idea? What is this knowledge that you both possess and use that he's talking about? The dilemma is um, for opponents of that view is that um, sensory motor knowledge is if, it, if we assume it can be possessed without actually being used um, that if that's the case then we need an account of what such knowledge consists in that doesn't collapse into something like the standard cognitivist accounts or if it does then we need um, the details of those accounts that don't run afoul of the hard problem of content see the last section the second problem might be then is what is this um, knowledge? If we go a different way, let's assume that the sensory motor knowledge is only ever exercised in appropriate ways, in appropriate situations. If so, then it's not possible for such knowledge to be logically distinct from its use. So you can't both possess it and then use it. You, you use it in the right circumstances or the way that you possess it is unlike that of hold, having a representation in your mind. Well, if so, it's unclear in what sense this knowledge doesn't reduce to a dispositional capacity. And in that sense, become something that is um, much more acceptable to a radically inactive position. So it doesn't seem that there's even room on this level to maneuver between those two options. So this is an example of some of the kind of clarificatory work that we think um, is important to do in the field. I think it also reveals that that position ultimately has feet of clay unless it defends itself in one fashion or the other. Okay, I'm going into the final section now and I'll try to be um, slower. Um, what follows from any and all of this? 
Well, let me go back to the beginning uh, of the comment I made about Evan Thompson. So in his review, Evan um, makes it clear that he thinks that good cognitive science should start from basic theoretical and empirical issues and use them to motivate the careful construction of a positive theoretical framework with testable models. Well, maybe that's something some, some have ambitions to achieve, but that isn't, I think, always the most important work that needs to be done and certainly not the most important philosophical work that needs to be done. Um, also, I think, as I suggested, we don't typically get to an end result in science where we have a singular model that we can all agree to. So whilst that effort may still be important, I think the outcome is unlikely that we'll come to a point where we don't need to consistently and regularly think through these philosophically attractive uh, pictures and to test their merits. Um, what's the importance of the work that we've been doing? Well, I think it was nicely summed up by somebody who really didn't like that work. Um, uh, Larry Shapiro in his famous review in mind uh, put it this way, somewhere in body cognition took a wrong turn and nowhere is this more evident than in Hutto and Meehan's radicalizing and activism. The authors of this slender book defend a thesis that would not only repudiate all of cognitive science to date, but that would also require a thorough reconceptualization of mentality and psychological processes. They deny what seems undeniable, but the stakes here are importantly high. I think that that um, effort to reconceptualize is where we get the real grit. This is where the theoretical or philosophical work meets uh, the practical domain with some degree of importance. Um, I can certainly say that some of the things, areas that uh, we were predicted to have nothing to say about turn out to be very rich fields um, in work on memory. Um, the philosophical work at least has been pushed very heavily in the direction of considering um, radical and activist positions on memory traces and whether there are such things and, um, and how that gets us a new way to look at the empirical data and its possible explanation. We've been working the same in areas on minds and skill performance and, and looking at what underlies this. And particularly, I'd like to highlight the work of my current PhD student who's doing work um, to help rethink um, how we think about habits and how they contribute to um, our behavior. That ties in really very well with Thomas Fuchs um, talk of the other evening. Or in the case of education, uh, here's an example of a more conservative take um, by Larry Shapiro himself, where he reduces the body to uh, the, the function of conveying information to whatever information processing system um, is driving our intelligence. But we've been working with others who've taken, again, a much more radical position on this, who think of the uh, embodied engagements as not conveying information, but as constitutive of certain types of um, intelligence that needn't be symbolically based. So new ways of thinking about how the body responds to uh, mathematical phenomena such as probability and shows some um, skillful engagement with it independently of even being able to use standard uh, symbolic um, tools to demonstrate mathematical knowledge. So there's a lot of different ways in which this is shaped and is shaping our thinking. Another area in, in the domain of um, psychology and therapy and clinical work, mental health work, um, we've been working with a number of approaches to look at some of their core assumptions and rethink them. In particular, um, Sean Gallagher and I have done work uh, in thinking about narrative therapy and how we might reconceive of it. Um, I can take that up more in questions if people like and give some concrete examples. My point here is this is turning out to be quite robust, but it's not because we've got a singular positive theory that we've handed over to practitioners and then they work out how from us to apply it. Quite the opposite. I think um, it's only through close partnership with others in these fields that we begin to understand what assumptions they might need to question or look at. Um, and the work here, I think, is really captured well by Fulford. What is needed is, quote, practitioners willing to and able to go deep philosophically and philosophers, on the other hand, going deep practically. Um, so much of what either has to learn from going deep 
is acquired only by working side by side in a shared learning experience. I hope very much like what we're doing here today. Thank you.